everybody. You too, Morning. sunshine. Okay. This is webinar number 20 for wxlive.us. Andy's even here. Uh, yes, he's I always am. here. He's always here. Anyway, it's Friday, April 20th, 2012 at an ungodly hour of 4.30. Nah, so. it's 6.30 in the real world. Yeah, real, real. Pacific time. So anyway, Pete Halstead's here, and he's going to He's gonna he's gonna prove that he can generate more than one exe from one WinDev project. You think that's, that's possible? Like five minutes. Yeah. Well, he'll just say there. Copy done. commands, pretty easy. Yeah. So anyway, um, it's all yours. All righty. Thanks, Pete. Well, this is a this is a pretty small little application I do for a client of mine that's a bank. Probably less than 50 screens in the entire application, but because of SOX compliance, it has to be broken up into a lot of different pieces. The, the inquiry piece of it is used by all their 130 branches, and they're not happy with just using security to control who can do data entry, who can do inquiry. So the inquiry has to be a separate EXE. And same thing with uh, the security maintenance also has to be a separate EXE because the people maintaining the security are not allowed to be in data entry or inquiry. So first of all, don't take banks as clients, they're a pain in the ass. But uh, anyway, uh, back in the Clarion days, my Clarion application, I had four different app files for this and I had some of the windows and code duplicated. Now I could have gotten even fancier, added a common DLL and shared some more of those windows, but at that point it was really starting to become a pain for a pretty small app. So I just duplicated the few windows that I needed in common between the applications. But in our new world order of uh, WinDev, WebDev, we uh, we have something called configurations and configurations let you keep everything in one project and generate different executables out of that one project uh, the easiest way to think of it is back in clarion days you had an app file that was generating an exe and you to go into those different ones, you opened up whichever app file you're working on. In WinDev way of thinking, we can have one project that is all encompassing everything involved with this project, and then the generation configurations are your individual apps, what you want to generate for this configuration. Well, so, Pete, I want to Pete, I want to tell you that in Clarion Eight, I have multiple EXEs in one project too. Oh, you're you're so bad. I do am, any of them work? They all work, and I and I give them out separate too. Sa same 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 uh, same project, uh, multiple apps, multiple you have EXEs. Multiple project files, Mo don't you? Oh uh, no, multiple apps. They're oh. all they're separate apps. No, but yeah, it's it's in it's in one it's in one project. When I open that it's one that, project, it's but one, you still well, have how about this? It's one files. it's 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 called one solution anyway. It's right. a solution, and you, yeah. yeah, yeah. But this but is you, this is you different. You still have to this maneuver is... to whichever app file you want to work on, right? Well, it's a multi DLL app anyway. Right. Uh, project. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and this and this Multiple app can be, but you're still in one you're in one project maintaining everything without having to open up separate app files or anything like that. Okay. And, uh, we'll see that shortly. Okay, cool. And then, uh, you know, that there's no need for a compile manager, of course, you know, as, as we're starting to get used to, WinDev takes care of everything for us. There's one button we hit and it'll generate all of our different EXEs and everything for us all out of one, so. Is that the goal? Exactly. Well, no, the the go is just for testing. Okay. Uh, we'll we'll see the multi-generation shortly. Okay. Cool. All right. So, 
Let's close that down. Here's here's our app file, and the uh, this is a app in progress. So yeah, don't beat me up too much over the interface just yet. We're still yeah, it looks a little too colorful for you. Uh, let's uh, let's start by showing you uh, some of the workings of it, and then we'll uh, we'll go do some playing from there. Okay, here's our inquiry application. Too and much if we too much transition, huh, Andy? Yeah. yeah. Wasn't that pretty? Here's Glenn's QBE, if anyone hasn't seen it. Pretty neat stuff. It was Glenn's QBE. Yeah. And and Andy's uh, little addition for loading the records in the background. <laughs> That's why it's so fast. He's using he's using Glenn's and my stuff. <laughs> I, I, I was wondering how they got tweaks to actually make it usable. I know. Now this is this is actually. Uh, I know this is Pete's here. Period. Yeah. This this is my document viewer. And remember, we're in the inquiry program right now. All we can do is scroll through this thing. We don't have uh, any of the scan functions. There's a separate toolbar with the scan functions. So now, if we go run the data entry version, now our scan bar came up. Notice our different functionality. And then uh, after we go through a generation again, I'll show you the app updater also, which is one of the other things that it's doing to automatically update my app whenever I change the version in the database. All right, so all that was generated out of this project right here. And you'll notice over here configurations. That's that's where this is done. And I haven't created the security configuration yet. I've only got three of them created: the data entry, the inquiry, and the app updater. Uh, you'll notice the little orange checkbox next to the data entry. That's the current configuration I'm working in. And where that's important is I am only uh, Notice the first window of my project is main menu. Now, if I switch over to inquiry, now the main menu of my project is the inquiry menu. That, cool. that setting of first window of your project is at the configuration level. And the, when we go into uh, maintain these configurations, you'll also see we set which components will be included and all kinds of good and wonderful stuff like that. Uh, and I'll take you into the configuration of uh, the setup of these configurations shortly. Uh, first, some general stuff. Uh, we were talking about the generation. If we come over here to our workshop menu, multiple generation and it shows me all my configurations and asks me which ones I want to generate my app updater I don't change very often I don't need to do anything there but I can generate my inquiry program and my data entry program this is the current version number and those no version numbers are going to automatically update when I generate so we click the generate button. And it tells me it made my two EXEs successfully. Now, if we come over to the EXE directory, in my EXE directory, you notice I have three subdirectories under it for each of my EXEs. 
and if we come into this first check exe and look at the details notice the version number is 41244 it's incremented that version number by one for me so now we're going to copy that over to our update directory and we're going to also go get the inquiry one where's your batch file man yeah. Well, there will be a setup program when we're all or done. Your, and or your so ready to software go. factory, you know, right? I've assigned that out to factory. Arnold. I'm waiting on him to get that piece done for me. Yeah, he's, you know, lazy. Didn't get up early enough in the morning or anything. Who, Sebastian Arnold? No, wrong Arnold. Oh. Young. Now we'll go change our version number in our dictionary. Now, when we run our inquiry program, it says the application updater is going to run. Really? And now our inquiry program is running, and we're now on the new version 4.12.44. Okay. So I got I got I, this is wonderful, but uh, I think that probably and I know that this doesn't seem to be the primary focus of this conversation this morning, but what? I would like you to go through the updater. The app updater is something I've had for a long time. I actually had a Clarion version of it, and I can't take a lot of credit for it. It was uh, something Bruce Johnson uh, worked on with me. At one of the DevComs one uh, one year, but it's pretty simple code, and we're actually going to see that code here shortly. So now we we've seen our different generations, and I'll go into the details of the, setting those configurations up. Um, but let's first take a look at our project code because that's where all of our specific stuff for our different versions is being done. Uh, we got some just general variables at the top. Uh, I'm finding out what the directory my exe is running in. I'm using that to uh, first get my uh, INI file. And also I want to know what is the exe that I'm currently running from. Because remember, your project code is common amongst all those exes. So, so this code lives in all three of those EXEs that we just seen running. So we have to put some logic in our project code to know what it's running. So the first thing we need to do is obviously find out what EXE we're running. And then we're you know, setting our database connection. All right, if we're running the app updater, then I want to fire off that little screen that tells me it's going to run in five seconds, shoot itself out to the app updater. If we're running in the inquiry mode, the IQ EXE, then we're going to set a global variable inquiry version equals true, and we'll use that elsewhere in our code to, to turn features off for the inquiry version. This is going out and getting the version out of the database. It's a simple little function that lives right here. And you'll now see where if it's the inquiry version, you know, that Boolean variable we set up in our project code, then I get the inquiry version out of our base option table. Otherwise, I get the application version out of our base option table. And then we're just returning that version to our other side. And here's a little trick. You know, I'm pulling two different variables with these, this SQL statement. By just aliasing both of those variables to the same name, then in my data source, I'm able to refer to it as version. And my data source doesn't care whether I pulled inquiry or application version. 
Hey uh, Pete, can you make your um, font bigger for us to see? Because you get. Yeah, I don't. Is there a uh, control key to do that, or? I don't know. In Clarion, you can go control mouse wheel and it'll. Uh, make it's too bad this is WinDev Live, Arnold. Oh, oh, sorry. I don't, I don't know. Does Andy, anybody? you happen to know? Can he get his editor? It's under uh, the editor under tools. Tools. Eh. Options or? Yeah, options under the editor. Options. Code editor. Font should be a font there. You see it. I don't have mine open, so I can't. You see it on my screen. Oh, here, wait a minute. No momenta. There we go. You found it? It's under coloring. coloring. There we go. Is that better, Arnold? Yeah, is that all right for you, Andy? Is... Yeah, I was fine. I have bifocals. I just moved my yeah. head up a little. Yeah, yeah. you know, we got to remember, Arnold's, you know, you know <laughs> I'm getting up the old years, you know. And if it don't work, I borrow the wife's trifocals, and then I'm good. Okay. So, it's good. So anyway, it's, that's, it's good that's a, it's a nice way to make our SQL statements a little more independent for situations like this by aliasing those variable names. The rest of our code is... Oh, I get it. Okay. Got it. All right, so back over to our project. So now we have the version out of the database. Okay, now the the one trick to this, remember I'm getting the exe name. Well, if you're running from the go button right here, your exe name is wdste.exe yep. because you're not running your exe, you're running the win time runtime. So there's a function called in test mode that returns a true if you're running from the go button. So if we're running from the go button, then I set my exe version to runtime so that I know elsewhere in my program that I'm running through the runtime, not running a true exe. That's a built-in function? In, I'm in sorry, test yeah, mode. that's a built-in function. Yes. Okay. Nice, <laughs> nice, nice, nice. All right, if if I'm not running in test mode, then I know I'm running a real exe. Then I use another built-in function that goes out there and pulls the version number information out of, you know, that's what we did well ago when we went to properties details. You know, it's it's using that version number that's actually embedded in the exe. Uh, that's that's one nice thing, you know, and I'm I'm sure I could have done it with some API calls in Clarion, but you know, having this nice little function to just go out there and grab it is pretty handy. The way I did it in my uh, Clarion app is I just embedded the actual version number in the exe and had to go in and change it, maintain it all the time, uh, and. You know, this, this also ties into the generation where it's automatically incrementing that every time I generate a new exe. So now we have both the database version and we have the exe version. So now we just compare the two version numbers. And if they don't equal and we're not running in runtime mode, then we fire off our app updater program because we need to update our app because our version numbers don't match. And that's yet another little built-in function, exe run, and it's just running our app updater. And it's passing in the file name because I only want to pull the exe that they're running. In other words, if they're running inquiry, I replace the inquiry exe. If they're running data entry, I replace the data entry exe. Hey, Pete, when you say that you... Um... Every time you generate the exe, it it, mm -hmm. it, it ups the number. Yes. Um, is this like every time I do? A, this is not like Clarin where I compile and every time I compile, this is going to increment my number, is it? This is uh, like yeah, yes and no. Cost. But remember, in in WinDev, 
you don't compile unless you're ready to release. Okay. So that's what I want to know because I didn't want it happening right. every every 15 minutes when I'm compiling. Okay, no. got it. Yeah, yeah, no, the go button does not increment that because it's not compiling. It's that configuration uh, thing you did, huh? Exactly. Right. The, the it's only when you do the multi configuration actually generate your exes. Cool, I like it. I like it. So then here's another little piece of code where that. Uh, splash green, I changed that description to have the word inquiry in the inquiry version. And then over on the uh, history invoice window, I'm, I'm using that same variable to when I call my image viewer to put it in scan mode or view mode. So that is the extent of our code that is handling all three of our different EXEs, turning all of our switches on, firing out to our app updater, and we'll actually go through the app updater code if, uh, if we get some time here at the end. But uh, now let's go take a look at our generation, or our configuration setups. Uh, again, we're in the inquiry version right now, and that's telling us that our main uh, menu is the uh, inquiry menu. And these also are respected by our go button, Arnold. So if I hit go right now and drag that window, oh, can't do it. I'm going to have to run it, log in, and then drag it. Now let me run that again. And it should come up over here. See, we're running the inquiry version, and we're running in runtime mode. Sweet. And, you know, just to get a little more screen time for the logo, you know, we'll pull that up again. Okay. Donations always appreciate it. Yeah, Andy. All right. Now, if we switch over to, and all I did was double click, now I'm in the data entry configuration. Notice our main menu is now the first menu of our project. Click go. Hmm. Where'd you go to? Hmm. Well, that's a little disappointing, isn't it? Well, Andy took it with him. All right, one more time. All right. Something, something odd's happening there. Arnold broke it. Damn it. All right. And then our app updater is even smaller. And its first window is the app updater window, which is actually its only window. All right. So now let's go into the actual setup of these. You look at the description, it's got my name and description and what directory I want to put the, uh, the resulting exe in. And that's where we were looking at this. Now here's something you can't do with your Clarion 8, Arnold. Notice it says I'm generating a 32-bit Windows executable. I knew you were going to say that too, man. I can, uh, I could have a 64-bit configuration. I could have a Linux configuration, and I could hit one button and generate all those out of my one project. So, can I do a, can I do a Mac? Mac. Uh, yeah, it's called Parallels. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right, so on the elements, notice how this is all the different pieces of my application here. You know, all my windows, my global variables, everything. And I only have app updater, custom message, and then the equates and the global procedures as elements of this project. That's the only pieces that get put into the EXE of this configuration.
then if you actually do a generation from here, Uh, from by hitting this button. Now this button is only going to generate our current configuration. You can also drop it down and I think there's a... So you don't have to have it open, you just have to have it highlighted? Well, it, that that is, you know, that the, the little orange arrow is your key. Notice the okay. little orange arrow changing. Okay. Whichever one the orange arrow is on is which one you're currently working in. So if I click generate now, so this this is me. where the this where the, this is where the number increments then. Right. Okay. And this this is taking me through the wizard. You notice when I did the multi generation, I didn't go through the wizard. It just generated all three. When I first set them up, I went through the wizard so that I'd get all these individual settings. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. It's okay. wanting to know now this is where I set my executable name, the icon for the executable, whether I want the main library included in the executable or not, custom error message whether I'm allowing UMC using their patch uh, system for updates, what my languages are. Then this is, notice that you're only seeing the pieces here that I included over in that, that description window. So at this point... Is this like the shipping? Is that like the shipping list? Exactly. That's exactly what it's like. And then this doesn't apply to me. And here, that this is all that information that's going to get into the properties from Windows Explorer. Oh, so that's like doing it here instead of in Setup Builder or something. And I haven't played with this, but you know, some some of you out there that are doing more shrink wrap type stuff, you can actually sign your uh, EXEs with a uh, certificate so that uh, Microsoft doesn't complain about them when they install. Nice. And this is your version numbering. Now, the cool thing is this, this is the the standard type versioning, major, minor, generation, revision. But in my other two configurations, I'm actually using the other option down here. And I just typed in 4.12.35 when dev is smart enough to, to see what I'm doing and increments that last digit for me. Oh, really? Wow. And then, what if uh, you have a letter? You see it there? It says 16.01. Yeah, I, I haven't I haven't tried it with a letter to see if, if it would uh, automatically next do letter. the letter or not. Huh? And then this checkbox here is what tells it to, to increment that version number every time I generate. And then I can link this to tasks. So that you know that that's part of the project management system. What I want to do as far as the uh, framework for WinDev, and then this is the individual pieces of the framework that need to be included or not. And I've never really played with this. I, as far as I know, WinDev is turning on the pieces that it needs. So. I really don't think you need to do anything here unless you're getting really fancy. Have you yeah, that found that to be great. different, Andy? Yeah. Oh, Andy's not here. He had to go to work. Oh. Must be horrible. Yeah. All right. Uh, 
here's your manifest list for Vista and Windows 7. And this will zip up when you do a generate. If you want, it'll zip up everything and, and put it over in a, uh, in a little backup spot for you so that you've got a, a set zip file of this version. Now, once, once you've gone through that wizard one time and got your settings where you want them, you never have to go through that again. Like you saw, we can, we can just do the multiple generation. Or even if we're just doing one of these, when we first fire it up, if we click the green check, it, it takes all the settings from last time and, and leaves them alone. That's pretty cool. Granular, but uh, smart enough to just go do it all. Exactly. Okay, so that is uh, that's pretty much the idea behind it, Arnold. Did uh, did I gloss over anything that uh, wasn't clear? No. Or no, I mean the the operative word is configurations. I can see. And, yes. Um, yes. And you can have EXEs that are 32 or 64 bit. It doesn't matter, right? Right. Yeah. No. Any any of these, we could generate a service out of here, a .NET library. Any of these could be generated out of this one project file with just multiple configurations. And like I said, where where this really becomes powerful is you know, and and I I admit I have never seen Clarion 8. Don't know the first thing about it. But the nice thing for me, coming from the Clarion 6 world, is even in my little application, it's broken into four different pieces. I'm constantly closing one app, opening up another app to work on. Oh no, you can you there. can open multiple at a time. Yeah. And, and here. You know, this is all my windows for all my projects, and I'm I'm working in all four four versions at one time. And there's ways to actually create folders here so that you could organize it into the different versions if you want for the stuff that only lives in one version or the other. So and you can do modules, modules basically, huh? Under right, that. but but all within one project file. Everything's accessible all the time. You're you're good to go. Yeah. So, um, what about if I have like a web dev type project? Would it go into the same project? Well, you know, web dev has its own interface, but it has the same, but same type of uh, project uh, configuration settings over there. And I know there is a way to blend your two projects. And Maybe Glenn there's some knows, compiler huh? directives to say open window or open page, but I I have yet to get into a situation where I needed that to, to play with that. Well, I was thinking you might have a web piece and a mobile piece to a project, right? right? right. And I, I know there is a way to blend your your projects together like that, but I have not done that. Uh, hey, Glenn, can you hear us? Can you can you chit chat? Does anybody know? Raise your hand. That's pretty cool. I think we'll look into that. But um, yeah, that's really nice. Okay. Hey, Glenn? Okay. All right. Is uh, is Michael on? Michael? No, he's not. Well, huh. who is that? He was asking about loopers. I was going to show him a little sample of the looper. But oh, uh, just show us, and he he can. All right. Well, you want to. he was asking about the difference between loopers and tables as far as web dev is concerned. And Alan says he can watch later. Yep, that's for sure. <laughs> and uh, as I was saying this morning, loopers are a little more the standard style interface for for web. Right. Uh, tables just you know, they don't lend themselves well for the web other than true data entry business type application. 
and even then there's you know my my take is depending on your application loopers are still a better way to to present stuff and this is a project we did that was a proof of concept was never launched so again don't uh, don't beat me up over the prettiness but uh, I used the heck out of loopers concept. in this thing wow and that launched somewhere there it is okay right here is a prime example of a looper really these these oh, oh I see these controls right here, the, the entry control and the checkbox, I defined those one time uh, and, and this little line here, and then I put them inside a looper. Now, I also told the looper that I wanted it to run in AJAX mode, and I wanted it to handle multiple pages anytime it gets over three to create a new page. So you see right now, I've got three of them. Now I got four of them, and that fourth one's over on the other page. Uh, so that minus uh, button there, is that in the part of the looper? Yes, sir, that is in the looper. And you you uh, manage the looper very much like you manage an array. You know, each of these is a subscript of the looper. You know, mm -hmm. so this is, this is subscript three of the looper. So do you just have three elements in that looper right now, or is that more... But there's actually four because you the line is actually part of the looper. Okay. But uh, nice nice thing is you notice that you know there's no refresh going on. You know all this is being managed by AJAX, and you know trust me, I did not write any code to do any of that. So so, so the the next page and the edit and all that that came. Part of all, all of this here, yeah, is is part of uh, window that you know you just drop that page. It's a page nation control or something like that. You just drop it on your screen and it manages all of that. Wow. And Alan's asking, yes, uh, can he uh, control how many? fit on a page and it's a property uh, prime example best buy amazon you know where you really see loopers a lot is e-commerce type sites exactly the stores uh, yeah. and most of those at the bottom have you know 10 to a page 20 to a page 30 to a page options all you do is set the uh, the property for how many fit on a page and when dev take, or web dev takes care of everything else for you. So if I went in and set the property to tell it that I wanted this to do, you know, 10 to a page instead of three to a page, it would blow everything down. And then I would be seeing 10 at a time instead of three at a time. Lovely. And I can show you one that's a little more advanced here. I mean, this looper has a drop down, a couple entry fields. You know, and you, again, all you do is define those. And uh, you you haven't seen the the window editor of Web Dev, have you, Arnold? Yeah. You get on one of those pages. Loading my 17 um, beta right now. Ooh. All right, here's here's our looper. You know, it looks like an Excel cells more or less. Uh, and if I go into the properties of the looper, maximum number of lines per page four. And again, this is a property that we could set at runtime. But I'm, I'm actually setting it at design time. 
And then these are the name of our controls that are in there. And then if we look at this control, it's a pager, pager. is the name of that control. Okay. And that's, that's set into AJAX mode, and that's what looper that is controlling. Which, by the way, another use of loopers, and uh, this is a this is a Glenn thing. He uh, he helped me create all this logic. My menu across the top and my menu down the left hand side, those are actually loopers, and uh, that was one of the things that I, uh, I believe it was uh, Sebastian mentioned this morning. If not, uh, yeah, it was Sebastian. Uh, you know, horizontal looper. This this looper up here can't get to it because it's in a template. Are you kidding me? You got loopers all over the place. Yeah, yeah, and this looper is actually a horizontal looper. You know, it's going this direction. Oh. You know, that's that's my top top menu bar. So, you know, that's a, a easy way to build dynamic menus is by using loopers. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Oh yeah, the horizontal. All, menu all my menus. This this entire application is is built out of the database. You know, my menus, everything is ran out of the database. Gotcha. Yeah. So that that's a little intro into loopers and why why you would use loopers instead of a table control. As you see, this interface is going to be a lot more familiar to web users than a table with edit in place or something like that. You know, it's, you know, it, it depends on whether you're trying to get a web interface or are you trying to mimic a Windows interface. Oh, that's super. Good. That's a good tease on, on loopers for me. Thank you. And then uh, we can uh, take a quick look at the app updater code if you'd like. Yeah, pretty, Andy would uh, like that. He's going to come back. Pretty simple. My app updater. This Remember, this is the first window of the app updater project. Did, hang on just a second. I may have noticed something there that Pretty cool if I'm right. No, okay. I must have just been dreaming. Lucky. Anyway, here's here's the code of my app updater. Uh, remember, this is this is the first window of the app updater exe. So this is running on its own. So the first thing I do is I go out to my base option, and I find out where I store my update exes. So that's where it's going to go suck them down from. I then have a timer procedure. And the reason I have a timer procedure, have you seen timer procedures yet, Arnold? I've seen that little green thing, but I uh, no, help me out here. The cool thing with that is you click on that little green thing, and you basically tell this procedure, I want this to fire the first time the Windows initialize, that this window initializes. Then I want it to fire so many times or infinitely, and how long between each time it fires. I told it I wanted to fire every once a second. And you can also do some things as to how it controls whether it steps on itself or not. So what this configuration is telling it is I want this timer procedure to run once every second for this window. So then the first thing I'm doing inside this timer. Hey, and when you set up that timer, when you clicked on it, where does it, where does it remember or save all that configuration that you just put in? Uh, this, black magic. It, I mean, so it's not, you don't see it in the code. You have to go to no, that you, green. You don't see it in the code. And I've got another, uh, Timer. There, there's also this is th these timers over here are pretty new. I think they came out with 15 or maybe even 16. Uh, there are also functions where you can.
create your own timer you can say this procedure is a timer and set some of those same properties they're not quite the same thing but you can accomplish the the same thing with a little more runtime control that's what you're getting at is it, at runtime what if i wanted to change it to 10 seconds or 20 seconds or mm -hmm. what have you and, and you can you can do that with uh with uh, some other functions that uh, so they got you kind of have an api to the built-in stuff okay. yeah that they they haven't brought those functions and this function completely together yet like i said this is pretty new to them so uh, i i think at some point the the other stuff will will be talking to this thing the two will become tightly married together and some of the other stuff will get depreciated but you know that's the nice thing that uh, WinDev is real good about is not breaking old stuff. You know, as we move from version to version, all of our old stuff pretty much works. So they're they're very respectful of not dreaming up, you know, changing functions, getting rid of functions, that kind of thing. They they add on, not not recreate. Yeah, that's what Glenn said. Glenn says, so, and with the timer in code, you can end the timer as opposed to not yes, being able yeah, to that, stop this, it. This timer, this timer, however I've got it set up, is what it's going to do. Period. The one that right. you set up yourself, you've got a little more control over turning it on and off, different things like that. Uh, and so anyway, we, this is going to fire once every second. The first thing I do is I increment my counter. And if you remember that application updater, when it ran, it was saying, you know, the application will begin updating in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Mm -hmm. There's that code right there. If the counter is less than 6, then my message is, you know, we'll be updating in 6 minus my counter. If it's 6, this, you know, so when we hit second six, that's where I'm actually doing my code to go remove my exe, copy the new one, copy DLLs, WDLs. Then when it comes back in here between six and 11, then I say, you know, I will be restarting in five, four, three, two, one. And when I hit 11, I run my EXE, and this is the reason I'm passing the EXE in, so that I can rerun that EXE once I've updated it. Uh -huh. So then I, I run that EXE that I just updated, and then I end this app updater program. It goes away. Life is good. Life is wonderful. Nice. I like how clean it is. Yeah, there's not, not a lot of code to, to accomplish that. And this, this is very generic. This app updater uh, actually, you know, is something that lives in all my projects. Uh, you know, the only specific thing about it is this uh, base option table. And I always have a base option table in all my projects. And since this is using my global connection, as long as I've got a base option table out there that has the uh, update path in it, then it's just going to work. So I, I can include this in all my projects. So so it's included. So it could have been put in a class then, huh? That well, be called. it's actually... I don't know where to see that. It, it's actually coming from my uh, SEM repository. You know, Andy oh. Andy showed us that uh, a few weeks ago in uh, one of the uh, webinars where, you know, in the SEM we have a repository that we're keeping windows and procedures that we use in a lot of our apps, and then you share that amongst all your apps. Oh, so this it's, is a share. This is a share right, rather than a right, copy. That, it, it's actually shared 
And the cool thing about that is, is it's a two-way share. So I don't have to go over to, you know, I want to change this. I, I decided, you know, this thing's a little, little ugly. I want to change this icon. And I want that to be the, the new icon in all my different projects that are using the app updater. Right. I can change it in this one. When I check it in the SEM, it's going to make it up to the repository in the SEM. The next time I pull any of my other projects, it's going to get that update. So I don't have to go over to the repository to maintain that screen. You know, because oh. it's shared, I can maintain that screen in how, any how can, of the projects that's sharing it. How can you tell that this is a shared guy so that you don't yeah. go messing I wish, up? I wish Andy was online because he could tell us better than me. I. You know what I mean? Because I. Yeah, if there, it was, there's a way to tell. We should make sure we ask him, huh? Not seeing him where 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 it is, but somewhere there's a there's a way to to see because which version it is, and, you know, whether it's shared dev, or not. Yeah, WinDev guys are good at putting little little hint things around, you know. So I thought maybe they're hiding yeah. a little icon yeah, no, or something. Yeah, no, it's it's it one one of the properties uh, will will tell you who's using it, where it's shared, all that stuff. I just uh. Got to get into that we'll SCM stuff right more. Now. Sure. But, uh, here we go. Oh, shares. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. See, this is shared in First Bank and it's in my repository. You can actually. So if I. Right. If, so if you had another. Show um, me who's got it checked out, what project it's checked out in. Uh huh. How many That's, times it's been updated? Well, if I had another one that wasn't shared, for one that's not shared, what would it look like? It, it wouldn't have that share tab? Uh, I'm not sure if it would have the share tab or not. So, like, if you open up another okay. window there, like your about window, would it have the? Would it have that? My about window is also shared. Oh, uh, okay. At this point, I don't have anything that's copied. It's either like this here. If we go to this one, this is not in my repository at all. Huh. This is just an able. Maybe that means something else. Oh, we're, we're, we're not. It's not showing us based on this. It's showing us based on what window we actually had open here. Now we'll see. See, file not shared. Sweet. Well, that's interesting. Good. You thought of everything almost, huh? Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty nice. And same thing with my global variables. Uh, you see, I've got two sets of global variables here. These are the ones that are specific to the first bank project. These are all coming from my repository. And same thing, I've got equates and global variables that I use in all my apps. Those I've defined as classes and I share via the repository. And then the variables that are global variables that I only use in the first make project, I defined over in my project code. Sweet. So it, it's a good way to to really, you know, and, and that's what I'm, this is the first project that I'm building from the ground up as a full-blown project in WinDev. So, you know, I'm taking a little longer and building up that library in my repository and so forth. So the next app that I create, you know, a lot of the work's going to already have been done for me. Yeah, sure. Custom message is another one that, you know, this this is, instead of using the message box, I use my custom message. And the reason why uh, is right here. You know, one of the variables that I pass to this thing says, hey, record this in the database. 
So it records the message I showed the user, plus I have another variable I'm passing to it to give it all the information that I included internally about where I was in the code and so forth. So, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever ran into the situation where a user says, I got an error. Well, what was, did the error say? I don't know. It said something about, you know, an error. Okay, did you print it out? Did you still have it? Well, no, I closed it. You know, that's, that's when I go out and look in my system log table and see exactly what the error they got, where they were, all that wonderful stuff. And another cool thing I'm doing here is uh, some of my procedures, uh, you know, I, I throw up a warning. If they don't do anything about it after five seconds, I'll go ahead and just close that window and go on. I'm using that delay before closing function of, of WinDev, which makes one of your buttons default for a certain amount of time. And one of the variables I'm passing in here is that time so I I can say this message window I want to stay up for five seconds then I want it to automatically close if they haven't closed it themselves yeah they, they kind of have it for themselves and the installs and all this other stuff exactly. too. exactly so. yeah. yeah yeah it's exactly how they're Sweet. doing all that yeah yeah I like the countdown you know yeah, that, you that's that. that's one of the things I really like about uh, PC soft is they definitely eat their own dog food they must because I I see those things. They go, wow! I wish I could do that. Oh, you can. Yes, yeah. nice. I I haven't seen anything they do that you can't do. You know, it's you know all all their toolbars, custom menus, everything that they do is straight Windev functionality. All right, I think that concludes it. Unless anyone has any other questions or I don't, anything else I they'd don't. like to see. I think you better go to work. Uh, remember, it's five minute commute, so I know I've got you time to make another cup of coffee. Okay, is there any other questions? Should I open up the speakers? Let's see. Anybody? Type it into Skype. He can read it. They're all thanking you, man. And I put them all to sleep first thing in the morning. Or oh, evening, no. depending on the, which side. Their, eyes, the are, their eyes are wide open. Wide open. This is a, you, you had a lot of good tips. Now, what you did, you, you just grew my uh, my keyword list. <laughs> I was just going to have configuration. Now i got to put configuration, loopers, error, okay. you know, I'll, messages. I'll be sure to stay on script from now on, Arnold. I, I wouldn't oh, no, even don't, make don't extra do that. for you. No, we're, we're part of the wandering crew. So well, anyway, uh, before uh, before we go, uh, definitely want to say a big thanks to you for getting up at the ungodly 430 hour to, to put this on at a time that works for some of our folks on the other side of the continent and my work schedule. Oh, no problem. This is uh, thanks for sharing. I mean, this is really cool stuff. It's inspiring for sure. All right. So, well, everyone have a blessed please. day. Yep, have a great weekend, guys. Uh, until tomorrow with Andy.